questions for you. Um, my first one is a little long-winded, and the second one's really short. Um, the first one's about um, the fact that technology is not a neutral thing. Um, technology, any piece of technology, be it a platform or an algorithm, um, it contains biases or limits of the people or, or the cultures that created it. So one example that I thought of um, is the Google Books corpus. Uh, because of the libraries involved in the book scanning, um, in partnership with Google. I'm assuming that the Google Book Corpus has a much better, better representation of Western writing than of other cultures. If you don't have this in mind when you're using Google's Ngram viewer, um, you could end up drawing wildly erroneous conclusions if you assume that all the books out there are in Google. Uh, biases are also inherent in computer algorithms that pro do the processing, say, that Maeve and Colin were talking about. So I'm wondering how you all account for these biases in your own work and how, since we're also talking about teaching tonight, how you uh, teach others to beware of the biases that are built into all of the, all the products and all the technologies that we use. Just throw that out there. So I've thought about this in, a, I guess, a couple ways. I think, uh, first, I think this is some advantage about thinking about how to um, situate digital tools historically and medially, right? Um, so just referring back to like the network corpus, and if I were to think about Smith's text and the topic model as representing two kind of cultures of visualization or something, I think in some ways creating these sort of historical trajectories uh, on the one hand, opens up critiques uh, from these earlier era, er, earlier moments, right? So critiques brought against Smith and later from by, I mean, uh, from an economic or other kinds of viewpoints, right? I mean, Smith's whole idea of mastering a system also uh, supposes a particular economic position. He's assuming kind of a the small property owner who has the view and command of his entire estate. In some ways, he's drawing a correlate cor comparison between that view and com uh, command of his estate with a view and command of this economic system. That there's a both a sort of property and a sort of knowledge position that he's thinking about. And I think in some ways, thinking about these earlier historical critiques allows us to think about the relationship to these new uh, technologies and how critiques that might be applicable to Smith might be applicable to certain topic modeling or other algorithm things that certain foreclose per certain perspectives while making other ones uh, available. And that sort of also leads to my, guess my second thought about that too is trying to set up the, uh, something like this, especially like a visualization in relation to other methods of visualization to get a more of a comparative relational approach that draws out the contingency sort of latent in each in individual approach. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's in, in here. I'll, I'll disagree a little bit, Jennifer. I mean, I, I mean, absolutely. I think we, we want to pay attention to that, but I'm not sure it's so inherent to, to, the, to the digital approaches. And my sense is that, you know, those type of biases, we would already be very much looking at them, even with conventional, right, a uh, uh, type of uh, uh, close reading, right? We would be very much aware of those and trying to pay attention to that. Uh, and I'd almost turn it on, on the head, on its head a little bit and say that uh, in some ways, uh, digital approaches may allow us to bring to light some of the maybe underrepresented um, uh, uh, topics, groups that we might miss if we were to go with uh, sort of, again, I say conventional, just sort of uh, 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 non-digital ways of cataloging information. Uh, in some ways, both these, you know, both Maeve and both Colin talk about how you, you lay out this digital approach and then let things kind of bubble to the surface, you know, and, and, and allow those things to come forth. And in some ways that's unlocking it, uh, uh, potential uh, topics that might not normally come to light. So. I'd, I'd love to pick up with that, um, especially because of the stuff that I work with in this project, um, much of it is anonymous. So um, one of the things that's really interesting about using these archives is that they make available a whole body of, of writing that is underprivileged in the academy because there's no name on it, right? We tend to think about texts as authored objects um, and strictly our conception of authorship is relatively strict. Um, and so it's not just that we 
um, get access to minor writing, which we do, which is so wonderful. I mean, nobody reads Huxley's reviews of literature because Huxley is a biologist, so they read him along with Darwin. So on the one hand, these technologies make available new kinds of correlations between writers, but they also enable access to texts that otherwise go unnoticed by the academy because they don't conform to our conceptions of authority. Um, I, I mean, I would say one of the things that we do have to tackle as digital humanists, um, or, or one of the one of the sort of limitations we have to ta tackle, is not just the the archives that we use or, or the programs that we're using, but the um, but the the I mean what you were talking about as algorithms. For example, statistical methods have all kinds of um, problems associated with them, and st statistics has its own way of managing those problems. I mean, I'm not a statistician. I live with one, and I <laughs> rely on I rely on him to to help me uh, sort of fix my statistical problems or answer answer statistical questions. But one of the things that I thought about when I kept encountering these these sort of questions about the legitimacy of what I was what I was finding in the data was t was this question about the extent to which conventional methods like close reading can also help shore up what we find using statistical methods and 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 I think in that regard one of the things that I that I say to my students when they're doing something that might rely on word clouds um, which I have used in my classroom is that we don't be afraid of hybrid methodologies so that we're comfortable as literary critics experimenting with things like statistical methods um, and doing our best to be as authoritative with them as possible or, or at least trustworthy as possible, but to not be afraid of combining methodologies. Um, like working with Scalar or other associated platforms, or I think any digital technologies, you often come up against the problem where there are things that don't fit in your system. Mm -hmm. um, and. I think the question to ask, or you know, what I see you asking is, is how do you know what isn't fitting in your system, right? So like, yes, I think that uh, you can, you know, that using digital technologies can bring to light all sorts of um, phenomena or uh, like examples or cases that we might not have seen. But I think there's definitely like an enthusiasm um, that's like paired with the like, and you know the kind of uh, scale and uh, like enormous amount of texts that are out there, um, that that has we haven't really developed the critical methods, at least as far as I've seen, to be able to see what remains absented or what remains invisible, right? So what are what are the exclusions that are necessary to be able to bring up even those cases that you wouldn't have seen and. I think to at least be able to say what those exclusions are is important. Um, and in many of the digital humanities, much of the digital humanities work they've seen thus far, that's not part of the conversation necessarily. Um, and I think it should be. Can, can I just respond to that very quickly? I guess, I guess, I mean, I just wonder the extent to which any kind of traditional research project doesn't suffer from the same problem. I think it does. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, I guess, it, I guess, in, I guess, I would just want to say that that's something that we all tackle constantly, mm -hmm. all the time, and that it's not necessarily something that digital research has to provide a methodology for for tackling. That we, in fact, maybe, in fact, digital research raises the question that we should have always been asking all along, and that there's a, there's an advantage to that. Right. I think that that I think that's definitely a question that has to be addressed, no matter what the research project is. Right. Um, and I, I just wonder if we're going to make a claim about like the uniqueness mm -hmm. of digital methods or digital mm -hmm. tools, like if we're going to say there's something different here, um, like ontologically, like there's some different, like something is happening to our research, then does that require a different method of understanding what's absent or what's excluded? Um, maybe not, mm -hmm. but I think it's at least interesting to think about like what is the what are the what are the different kinds of approaches that we would have to start to answer that question mm -hmm. with I know that one um, <coughs> one reason why Gwyneth wanted to organize this evening was to um, have also have the speakers address how to get into digital humanities if you're interested in doing it technology is can be fun but it can be a barrier to entry so what would you suggest to, to uh, people who are interested in dipping their toe into some kind of technology enhanced research or teaching methodology? H how does one get started? 
it's definitely something that's uh, collaborative, right? And that's, I think, part of what draws people into the, the, the field, uh, maybe more than anything else, is that uh, you really just need to seek out, I think, um, uh, groups and uh, courses and, and uh, uh, folks that are, are willing to, to sit down with you and, and, and start from point one. And to me, I, I just don't I don't see a lot of other fields, at least in academia, where you have that type of openness. I, I think there can be certain examples of, of where it's not that that way. But uh, I, I've found by and large, comparatively, it is very open to to doing that. So like anything, it's it's something where you uh, have to have a sense of play and, and, and a sense of, of willing to sit down and, and work on something that's not conventional in the sense that uh, when you were doing work for, for your uh, in, a, in a normal way, right, when you're trying to write a paper or complete a book where you you feel like you're putting out X number of words. This is something where you may sometimes have to just sit down and play with the tools to work with it. But I definitely think it's something where uh, it's unusually collaborative uh, it can, for for me at least as a historian, uh, uh, where you get to work with others and and, and they tend to be more welcoming. And I, and I think that's an advantage. Yeah. And, and we're also really lucky in New York because there are a number of um, universities that have working groups or. Um, sort of collaborative groups like like the one here at NYU, which sounds like a really interesting project that you should probably speak about. But I know Columbia has one um, that I've been to on a number of occasions. Um, and those are places to go where literally you don't have to contribute. You can just sit and learn about the software people are using. Also, Google is awesome in its searching because it it throws up the stuff that people are searching for, right? That's the first, that's the way its search mechanism works. So when I was first trying to figure out if there were digital tools that I could use for thinking about this stuff. Voyant, which used to be called Voyeur, came up first. And it's a really easy program to use. Um, Cortex is really complicated. So I wouldn't recommend that as a first, you know, toe dipping exercise. Uh, can I just emphasize that too, is that it's one of the things you actually can self teach pretty good online. and. And that's odd. I think there's a lot of things that uh, you do in life, like learning a language, which you can't just do by uh, looking up for, for tutorials online. But um, a lot of stuff you can learn. And there's great forums online. It's sort of the community of, 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 of computer science in a way that's sort of grown up with this uh, DI, you know, do-it-yourself type of ethos with it. And, uh, and uh, looking for, if you have a question, you post it, and usually you get an answer of some type. So not always a friendly answer in some cases, but uh, <laughs> the online world is, is quite wild. But I mean, you can uh, self-teach in a way you can't in a lot of skills, uh, I think. So. Well, when I uh, came to, I, I mean, I did not have any uh, prior like programming experience. I was really coming in new, like when I, around the time I was starting my doctoral program. Um, and for me, I think what it, what is those crucial to sort of echo what everyone's been saying is uh, beyond just collaboration, setting up and finding spaces to cultivate um, cross disciplinary conversations. Uh, I mean, that's what the digital experiments group has been so useful for me because I think you have to somewhat acknowledge, uh, especially when you're getting into uh, more complicated programming languages and statistical methods, that regardless of how much time you try to teach yourself, you're going to lack the sort of knowledge. And so it's, I think a lot of it is uh, establishing a level of familiarity so that you can think about the possibilities that a uh, programmatic or computational approach might enable, but also enough sort of fluency so that you can talk to programmers or computer scientists and uh, communicate what you would like to do with um, computer science and how they might contribute and also be able to sort of pitch your particular research question or problem to people outside of a specific discipline and make it interesting. Like for example, right now we're working on this thing called the epigraph project and partly what's interesting about the epigraph project is because I think the epigraph is a unique genre that poses a literary critical and a computational problem because the epigraph since it's defined by its sort of brevity rather than its massiveness or its bigness if we want to talk about big data it represents a computational problem because how do you uh, take account for the epigraphs in the relationship to larger texts uh, when they are by their definition tend to be smaller and hard to sort of pick up but with traditional text mining techniques so like for pitching that to uh, programmers and people outside of the English department it's been really useful appealing to uh, questions both the literary critical questions, but also pitching the computational questions that this kind of collaborative project might open up for people outside of like my field. So uh, I, I'd like to start by just giving you a simple problem 
and find out whether you have programs that could actually attack it. Um, th there's a guy named Shakespeare, <laughs> and he's supposed to be able to write okay. Then there's a guy named Mark Twain who was also somewhat successful. You got tons of people who weren't so successful. And so uh, the, the research thing that I would throw out is um, let's just throw all those people into a hat and find out what about their writings distinguishes the ones that were successful from the ones that weren't. Mm. And so uh, the question is what would you use and how would you go about researching that, that one question mm. so I could find out how to become a great writer instantaneously. <laughs> There's a really interesting program at uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison called DocuScope, I think. I think it's called DocuScope. Um, and one of the things that the program does is it, um, it, it tries to organize uh, texts according to their various semantic features. So you can tag the text. For example, you can determine how much descriptive language is in Dickens' novel versus um, Hemingway or whatever. And so that's a program that is interested in trying to figure out various kinds of semantic things that are in texts and then think about, I mean, there, I, I don't know if there's anybody working there who's thinking about success, you know, like how successful is it if you're super descriptive um, or not descriptive. Um, but I, I know that they are working on, on, on questions like that. One of their projects is to try to finish um, the mystery of Edwin Drood. So what, what, what would the end of the text look like if we were to use the, the computer program to essentially populate the text with semantic features that are typical of that text? Um, but but that's, that's the kind of thing. And, and there, are pro there are other programs that I, don't, that I know exist but don't know anything about. I know about that one because I've presented with um, Catherine DeRose who is working on that at Madison. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. I mean, I think there's, there's, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you could sort of measure similarity. So, say we were just take the Twain text, right, and take every uh, fictional or whatever genre classification we would use with his text for the period in which he was publishing. We, there would be easy sort of algorithms that we could use to figure out uh, which uh, texts are the most similar to Tain, text to Twain's text in terms of uh, vocabulary even in terms of some uh, syntactical structure. So which one had most sort of, uh, kind of syntactical style most similar to Twain and the most similar like word choice as Twain. And then we could sort of compare and look at uh, those texts, the most similar ones to Twain and see were they successful or were they not. And then we can start getting into social questions about, all right, so what distinguish maybe those, the, the actual social sort of situation of the publication of those texts from Twain's texts, right? And so in a way, what basically what I think there's some of these programs could do is sort of narrow the field and sort of remove some of the chaff in order to find the texts that are the most similar and then start to ask that question within a very sort of specified local context and make it more sort of manageable. So there are definitely ways to do that. Someone like David Hoover in the English department does a lot of work with that, like looking at the similarity between texts, doing like authorship attribution, and uh, he would also be like a great person to talk about like ways of doing that. Thanks. Um, I have two questions, and the first is sort of a broad question about how you ensure that you don't lose sight of the humans in your humanities studies when you work so closely with digital sources. But also my second question is about thinking about the digital world with a more sort of presentist perspective. Um, and what I mean about sort of with this question is corporate entities tend to control a lot of what happens online these days. So I'm a historian, and I think about historians 30 years from now trying to gauge you know, what people did in 2014. They're going to want to access our digital imprints, but our digital imprints are owned by Google and Yahoo. And they can erase these imprints sort of at will. So as digital humanists, do you feel a responsibility in the current day and age to maintain these imprints? I would say I don't in the sense that, uh, <laughs> well, it's too much work, right, uh, Valerie? But um, uh, I think there is, I mean, there are efforts to do that a bit, right? We have Library of Congress that, that tries to capture what's online. And, and as far as I know, there's no corporate blocking of that, even though, yes, I think you're absolutely right that there's, there's sort of ownership of that digital imprint there, and, and, and the concerns are certainly there. 
uh, and the same with the, the British Library, seeking to you know catalog aspects of the web. But uh, as you you know, the archive always has. Uh, it's always going to be incomplete in terms of what's saved and what's not. So I, if anything, we're going to have far more than we ever would have had for, you know, 1900 or for 1800 uh, survived. Um, uh, for the, the first part of the question, though, on the, on the, on the, where the humans go, right, I think that's, that's absolutely a, an issue as well. Um, maybe not, I mean, it's always the same sort of situation regardless of your approach. I, I, you can kind of sense I'm getting the argument that the, 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 a lot of what we do with the digital uh, here is not that much different from what you would do without the digital in terms of your what you're looking for. Um, uh, but it certainly is the, the concern, right, when you, you're, you're sitting here encoding data and you're, you get it reduced. What used to be something on paper showing these people's lives, say, on a census form, gets reduced to just the, your, your numbers in your, in your, in your table. Um, I mean, pedagogically, I can tell you that what my what we did here was uh, we actually uh, insisted that the students come up with their statistical conclusions, but place it within a context of uh, of researched images, uh, researched uh, uh, alternative sources that would uh, get at sort of that human story that goes along with it, rather than just looking at the at the, the charts and whatnot. Um, which uh, again I think is important because otherwise you 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 risk going back to what at least from the historical field was predominant in the 70s, which were books were were almost, I mean they were very insightful and they're very good reference sources, but they're not necessarily humanist in the sense that they're readable, right? So um, hopefully uh, you, we don't lose that uh, in terms of placing numer numerical conclusions next to really qual qualitative sources. So. I think uh, in terms of like the first the first question, the human, I think that's why, uh, and that's sort of, I guess, what, what I was trying to gesture towards in talking about a kind of critical approach that attempts to situate uh, the digital methods so that we're not black boxing the algorithms, but actually trying to think about their uh, intellectual, historical antecedents. Uh, and also, I think there's other ways to do that too, right? So someone like uh, Alan Liu, who I've already mentioned a couple of times and is like sort of my like DH guiding light. <laughs> uh, is uh, talks about like a study of science and technology approach, right? So you could, whereas I was sort of trying to do like an intellectual tracing, you could uh, see like the same thing, think of these algorithms, actually look at how they were developed, like what what labs they were developed in, like in Princeton, who was coming up with topic modeling and how uh, their sort of intellectual influences and stuff. I think there's ways in which you can sort of uh, always pair the sort of the social and the human with these approaches by taking these other uh, humanistic methodologies that we already do very well. And I, I think that's why if the human is going to be identified anywhere with these algorithms it's within uh, DH, because we already have uh, the critical apparatus um, and tools uh, to bring, to introduce and think about the role of the human in both the production and the use of these kinds of tools. Um, and in terms of the, just the preservation and sort of, I think that's one in like the, co the corporate ownership stuff. I mean, I think, that's why it's good to try to use uh, open source things. Like most of the programs I'm working in, like Python, R, Linux, are open source. Uh, additionally, I mean, I think that's like another subfield of the DH. If you want to look at like media archaeology, it's someone like Matthew Kirschenbaum who's specifically thinking about these methods of preservation. And so, I mean, another sort of good aspect of this sort of big, big tent, as they say, DH, is that there are many people thinking about all these questions in different places and for different uh, vantage points. I think we really need to think about it, though, because it's something, especially if you're a graduate student and you want to start a digital humanities project working with archives that your university, you probably don't know, spend five to $10,000 a year on. I mean, this is something that was a, a, a real rude awakening for me. I left NYU last year to start a tenure track job. Huzzah. <laughs> and then I got to my university and they couldn't afford to pay for the digital archives. And so... I have found some creative ways of uh, acquiring access, but accessibility is an issue. And I think one of the things that we really need to think about is how we make noise to these larger, you know, sort of online libraries about making accessibility something that an, an, an individual scholar who may not even be associated with the university um, can have, um, because no one can afford $5,000 to subscribe to C19, you know. Um, so it's something worth really thinking about and making noise about. Thank you. 
both for mentioning libraries and mm -hmm. archives. As a librarian, I will say that we s spend almost all of our time just thinking about that. Where is our cultural heritage going? Um, is it going to be tied up in for fee services or licensed materials rather than purchased materials? We're very concerned about this. And in uh, we have digital library initiatives and um, digital archives initiatives and attempting to not just preserve born digital things, but also digitize for preservation. Um, but it's, it's a huge issue. So this may not sound like a sympathetic question, but I teach this. I'm, I'm published in DH, so it is at least from within that tent somewhere, or maybe on the outer edges. I guess what I'd like to know in terms of especially your students, where's the difference between use, critique, Making, design, I mean, where, where are the lines with those things? Is, is making at the level of writing in Python? Or is making at the level of content production or visualization? I, I guess I'm kind of curious where the literacy function is, since we're not talking about the same thing as print culture. There are multiple layers that operate in different languages human natural languages and machine readable languages and then some that sort of scale between the two um, and then same thing with digital media production with video with audio with images these things don't operate the same way as our, our as our sort of knowledge production did before so i'm curious where that falls in terms of pedagogy for you all i think any of those could fall into it i mean when you when you go to design a class you think about what you want them to do at the end of the class i suppose and for me uh, uh, it could be a mix of those. It could be one in particular that I want them to have at the end. Um, but I do, I do think that's a, a, a huge question because we think about, to the, to the, the extent we do ask it in, in uh, academics, is well, what are they supposed to have at the end of the, the course? And I think uh, nobody really, people instinctually seem to know, but we don't really come up with a, a clear sense of what that has to be. And it's very much left up to uh, uh, the, the individual faculty member. Um, uh, uh, and so maybe that's uh, something that uh, is a bigger curriculum question, right, that, that would be asked and, and to what extent do we prefer, uh, uh, prepare students to have those, as you could say, literacies in those various areas. Uh, and what are we going to emphasize? Is it going to be all of them? Or is it going to be the sum that we feel is most useful for that particular major or something like that? Uh, but to me, I think it's, it's kind of nice because it's, I don't have to demand that my students are uh, working in one literacy, namely writing an essay, you know, uh, again and again in, in every course. Now, that I, I expect them to, to, to per, where they are presenting that type of writing, that type of literacy, I want them to be good at it, and I work with them to, to do that. But um, I think what's nice is you could do all alternate skills, uh, alternate literacies, you could say, and, uh, and uh, assess those for, the, for that class. And, 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 uh, and I think that's useful. I would, um, I would say that I think that that's an important. It's an important to think through those different literacies, and it, in particular, the difference between, say, bringing a, some kind of tool um, or technology into the classroom, whether it's Scalar, or whether it's a video camera or a microphone, right? And on one hand, you can say, "Here is how you use this," right? And I imagine with like the the tools that you're working with as well like it's about training the students or giving them a tutorial right um which isn't necessarily the same as like learning uh you might be using that tool to help them maybe critique some you know uh some set of like historical frames or some set of uh you know historical narratives maybe in the case of scalar like breaking apart like a certain linear narrative um, so you could use it for critique, but I think a lot of times uh, it's it's difficult to even get past that. You know, first we're going to train you not not to mess up the system, to be able to use the system, <laughs> right? Um, and to feel like you're competent, right? Like I feel like that's like the the notion of like feeling like you know there's some sort of literacy and with and then to be able to to be able to to critique or to experiment with alternate ways of using the system, um, I feel like there's that's that's several steps down the path because if you, you know, if you take like a camera, um, like I'm just thinking from like film school, like I went to film school and it, like you you give somebody like a digital camera and the first thing they do is they shoot a film wrong. Like that doesn't make it like an avant-garde like art film. It just means that they didn't know how to like 
change the shutter speed, right? So they... So what then like makes something critique like first you actually had to learn how to use that system. So with these with these digital systems what I would be scared of and what I feel like I have to watch out for in, in class is that so teaching them how to use it but then having how to like envision like alternate ways of designing that system um that I think is hard to do at the same time as you're trying to give them competencies in the correct use of the system. So with Scalar, um, as an example, like there are all sorts of ways, like this happened with like, uh, you know, one of the classes that I taught where I was like, okay, here's the, the ontology that like I set up and I want you to like, when you put something in here, I want you to, and I gave very clear instructions like written out as like, when you put your own work in, I want you to like tag it with these sets of things. Of course, no one's followed the instructions and the whole thing ended up a mess and like, and you know, so there was that very detailed attention that was like needed in order to be able to participate in the way that would make um, the content and the interesting like networkedness of that content legible to anybody outside of the class. Um, and and so I failed in that sense. Um, and so did the students out of that process of like not paying attention to what I did learn alternate ways of configuring the content? I'm not sure, you know? <laughs> Uh, okay, well, so the first three talks all sort of uh, dealt in various ways with this issue of fragments, right? Um, so uh, in the first talk, or uh, we're, 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 one of the talks we're looking at the, the statement form of, right? And we're pulling form of from all these different texts, right? Like it, necessarily out of context in a way, right? That's part, part of what we're doing. And then, and then seeing what kind of new contexts or seeing how they confirm our biases or, or contradict our biases. Right, and the same thing with Scalar, right? They were pulling fragments, right? In this case, even images, video, photo, all kinds of fragments, uh, and making a, a new path through that way. Just like we are with, you know, taking the statement form of, right, and making a new path through the text that way. And Collins' work, exactly the same thing, right? We're looking at the index, uh, the actual text, and then the uh, topic modeling, right, and how those produce different texts. Well, so the question I have is, uh, in doing these kinds of activities, uh, especially in doing them with students, right? Uh, what kind of phenomenological difference is there in reading a text with a computer than doing it these other ways? Because of course we had indexes, right? We had concordances since the 13th century. And in some ways, many of the things we're doing, we could have done then, but of course no one does because it would take a lifetime, right, on, with a pen and paper to do some of these things, right? Now we can do them immediately. Or, you know, if you're not such a good coder, maybe not quite immediately, but still, you know, within like six months, which is nothing compared to like, you know, a life. So uh, are there any kind of like differences in actually, you know, performing these tests that we can practically do now that we could never do before, that would even have been impossible to do 50 years ago, uh, just from, from doing these activities? Uh, I'm very curious to hear. Thank you. Part of me feels like you answered your own question in some way. Sorry. I mean, I, th that's like the cheekiest response I could possibly give, maybe because I'm not sure how to answer your question. But part of it is that um, what we couldn't do before was read this many texts at the same time. And so, and I feel like this is something that we all, in, 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 all, in different ways, we addressed the question of scale that, um, that we could not. I mean, there's the most wonderful one of the most wonderful characters in all of literary history is Casabon from George Eliot's Middlemarch, right? The guy who tries to create the key to all mythologies, right? So he tries to create an encyclopedic account of all knowledge. Well, he's a failure in the novel, one, because he's antisocial, but because it's, he, it's all he does all day long, um, but also because that's not a project that can be accomplished in the 19th century. Now, I'm not saying that what I'm offering is that. <laughs> Please, God, I'm not Casabon. Don't leave me out in the cold. Dorothea, um, but 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 the but there is something to say about the extent to which we can we can endeavor to or we can inquire into much larger quantities of texts, much larger quantities of objects in the world, whether they are wh whether they are visual or textual. The way we can put those things into a conversation with one another in ways that we couldn't efficiently um, or even practically in a lifetime of scholarship. I mean, the fact that. The fact that I was able to think about 8,000 texts together would never have happened in a lifetime of scholarship before. And I think that there's something about that scale and scope that is really exciting, if deeply problematic, if, and, and, and if filled with its own um, problems that we have to tackle. 
I would just say from uh, it's my perspective, um, I because I guess my particular approach in this sort of comparative method, I've been just continuously kind of struck with, um, not if we're going to speak phenomenologically speaking, the um, the sense. If, let's recall that Hugh Blair quote, right? Like the fact that I feel like there've always been these different genres and strategies in which to try to get this what he calls the scientific view of the entire system, right? I'm also reminded of something like Anne Blair's book too much to know and talking about even like the renaissance and uh 18th century scholars or medieval like finding these you know crazy different cataloging devices as ways of trying to sort of master this massive amount of knowledge and i feel like topic modeling in some ways looks like that uh, it appears like that because they're phenomenologically speaking it can be this great sense of comprehension uh but what i think comparisons sort of reveal is that there's always a certain uh you know sort of foreclosing a certain narrowing that's happening as well, a certain abstraction, right, that's inevitable. Uh, however, if, if I wanted to sort of just put pressure on my own sort of move here uh, to try to actually make topic modeling talk to 18th century topics or indexes, uh, I think, you know, there's also, I could also be challenged to say, like, whether these, this sort of synthetic or kind of uh, anachronistic move I'm making in itself is uh, a, attempting a kind of comprehension that is... Uh, Unwise. <laughs> right, so it's it's maybe unavoidable. I just one last thing on that is that uh, I think I think Colin, you have exactly right that this is this is always something that's been tried to attempt, and, you, and your your original question brings this up that this is trying to know the text and and come up with a way to catalog it is is is, is something that's always there. But what's interesting about this, multiple, like Maeve said, there are multiple ways to do this very quickly and ways that can easily integrate, or not easily, but should be integrated with libraries, right? Which is, you've created all these new pathways for encapsulating a text in a, in a summary way, or making a, me a meta text for the text to, to catalog it. And those things shouldn't just be for analysis, but could be also ways of holding it in a catalog. So um, there's just, there's just breaking down that disciplinary barrier is just so interesting, you know? And that's, I think, what makes it, what makes it different in many ways, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to remind you that there's food and drink outside, and we will all be there, and we will all talk to each other, and it will be lovely. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thank you to our speakers.